Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'll show you how we can get started with Anti-Framework Core 2.2 in .NET Core 2.0. So, in the previous video, you might remember we have this post service that upon initialization we create some posts in them and then we deal with them in our code. So, for example, in our post controller we have a get, update and all that. We're using this service so everything is in memory. What we really want to do is we want to have some sort of persistent storage. SQL Server will be what I'm going to use here, and that's because we want to use anti-framework with it. What is anti-framework? Well, in two words, anti-framework is just a way to write C Sharp and have that translate to SQL. So you never have to actually deal with SQL, everything you do is with C Sharp. So that's why we use it, it's very easy, it's very nice. We're going to use that and it's going to be good enough for what we're going to show. Keep in mind, this is more of an introduction. As I go with this series, we will show more things on the subject. But for now, we're just going to see how we can replace this in-memory type of thing we have going on with anti-framework core. So the first thing we want to do is I'll just remind you, we created uh, our project as an identity project back in the first video of the series. And that's because we wanted this data context here and these migrations. Essentially, all this really does is it adds Entity Framework SQL Server by default in our dependencies. So you can see this package here and then the tool set and all that and the design. These are packages we would have to use to reference in order to use that. So if you are to add it after the fact, you'd have to reference these packages yourself. But for, for me, in this case, it's just pre-referenced. So Entity Framework uses something called the DB set. And the DB set, you can see it as representing a table. In our case, we have posts. Uh, normally, what you would have is your domain object and then your DTO. And your DTO is what is really being saved in your database and you're just mapping around. But just for simplicity, we want to use the domain object in this case. In the future, if our domain object looked uh, or starts looking any different than our DTO should be looking, then we will introduce that concept. But for now, we're just going to use this. So what we need to do in terms of the data context first is we need to add a DB set of named posts. And it's going to be a DB set of type post. What this represents is, as I said, a table. So if I were to run migrations now, we're going to see what migrations are. It would create a table called posts. We actually have control over that, so we could just we would just say table and then name some name, but we won't do that. Posts is fine for now. It's actually fine in general. It describes what it really is. What we're gonna do though is we're gonna add the key annotation, and this key annotation uh, specifies that this ID is a GUID, and it's also our um, primary key. That's what we care about. So it's gonna be auto-generated on creation. We won't have to specify it. And it's going to be what drives the whole entity framework to do its thing. So let's just save this here. We don't really need to do anything else here or in, in the post. Let's see how our controllers look. So they're all synchronous and they all use this service. Uh, we're going to have to change this service. So let's go to the interface and let's see what we have. We have get posts, get post by ID, update post and delete. Uh, the create is missing and that's because we're using this technique here to do that and we just add to the list so what we also need here is a method that creates the item but what we also need on top of that is to change every single one of this to an async method and that's because anti framework supports async in their extension methods to retrieve uh, data and we need to use that because it's io operations and we should be using async in order for our application to scale uh, really nicely uh, before I change the interface, let's just go to the service itself and let's kind of rewrite it. So we don't need this, but what we do need is a private read-only data context. And we're going to call that data context. And we're going to inject that to dependency injection. So let's go and change what we used to have to the new, uh, to the new way of doing things. So we need to await a data context and then we find post which is our db set and then we say uh, and then we say to list async and this will return every post now keep in mind this is an async 
method, so we need to change this to an async task. And we have to do the same for every other method in here, so let's just do that. Let's copy that, this will be the same for everything. And there needs to be async, and this needs to be an async task of post. Now for this, again, async task of boolean, but we won't quite do it this way, updating, updating just works, so we don't need to see if it exists or not. We're just going to provide the post that we're going to save. So let's do await data context posts and then update. But that doesn't just update anything, it just says, hey, when the next time you save, I want to update this. So for that reason, we need to also call the save changes async method. Now this method returns um, an integer and that's the count of how many items have been affected by this, in this case updated. So in order to return boolean, we're going to say that, oh this doesn't need to be async, we're going to say, hey, if we have at least one thing updated, which is what we are actually doing here, uh, return true, or else return false. And we have to do the same for delete post. Now we're going to have to select first in order to delete because there is no deleting based on an ID in uh, Entity Framework. So let's just do the same. So we select the post, we remove the post, and we save. This is not a sync, so we should not await it. Here we go, and again, we do the same thing, var deleted equals this, and then return deleted more than zero. Simple. And now the last thing we need is create, because we didn't have that, so we need a public async task that returns full. Create post. Then this is post, post. How do we create? Well, we do data context posts add async and then we add our post and don't forget we have to save changes and again created equals the number so return created bigger than zero that is all good but we, what we have to do now is go to the interface and change that as well and we also need to add this method so let's just do that we're going to add this here, and then let's say task of this, and then task of this, task of this, task of this. Yep, yep, yep. Cool, so now our interface actually matches our implementation, which is all good, nothing is complaining. Something very important, just for clarity and for other developers to be able to understand our code, it's very good if we actually add the async suffix in async awaitable tasks. So, get post becomes get post async, get post by id becomes get post by id async, create post becomes create post async, so on and so forth. So let me just update everything. So. Now with everything updated, let's just save that. We do have to do a couple of changes in our controller, but before we do that, let's see in the DB installer. You see how the data context is added, and it's added this way, we just add DB context. The context, the default DB context uh, lifetime in the service container for this context is scoped. You can actually see it in um, this overload method. But you cannot have a scope dependency in a singleton registered service. So for that reason, we're going to change this to scoped. What scoped really means is that the lifetime of this is the same throughout the full request. And that's done for tracking. That's why we use that. So a couple of changes. First and foremost, this should be awaitable. And this should be an async task. So let's just update every one of these methods to be async task. Awesome. Post service that create post async. We'll get back to this method in a bit. 
uh, updated. Yep, this needs to be awaited as well. Same goes here, same goes here, same goes here. Okay, now create post request no longer needs an ID here because this will be automatically generated so we don't actually need to specify it. But we do need the name because that's a property we added in our post. So let's just set that. And let's update this to name and we don't need this anymore. Perfect. So this now will create our post and our controller looks perfect. I think. Yeah. Okay. So our service is ready. This is ready. What is not ready is our database. I can actually open uh, SSMS, um, my SQL, sorry, uh, Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio. And if I refresh my databases, you'll see I have nothing related to Twitter book. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look into the app settings and you can see we have some default connection string for my MS local DB. Let's just change this a little bit and only keep the tweet book here. And that's going to do it for a connection string. You can change that to anything you want. But for now, I'm going to use my own local MS, MS SQL um, DB. And there's nothing else we really need to do in terms of code. What we do need to do though in terms of action is we need to generate a migration because now that we changed our uh, domain objects, in this case DTOs, and also our DB context, we need to notify the database that, hey, things changed and this will generate a migration. There's two ways to do that. You can do .NET EF migrations add or migration add. But I'm going to use the partial equivalent, so add migration, and you're going to say added posts in, added posts is good enough actually. And this will generate now a migration based on the changes we did. And the migration is just a C-sharp thing, a C-sharp class extending migration, which says um, when you run the migration for the first time, actually when you run it in general, just create a table named posts and then have an ID and name columns and a primary key. That's all automatically generated for us. And then when you remove the migration, remove this from the database. And you can see we actually have two migrations here. The first one has to do with the identity schema because we enabled authentication when we created this. Just by creating this though doesn't actually mean we run it. So if I refresh this, there's nothing there still. To run them, you have to use the update database command and let's see what this does anytime now as you can see it's generating some scripts and then it's running those scripts so it says it's done let's see our database then and if i refresh that if i can actually hit a refresh yeah we have our database created with the tables here are the identity tables, and here is our own table. It's a post name table, and it has an ID and a name. And that's it, exactly as our post object. Another table that's interesting is this EF migration history. This keeps track of what migrations have been executed to our database, and it doesn't rerun them in case they're actually executed. So that's good for now. Let's now run our application and see what's going on. Okay, so let's try to get all the posts first. So let's just run this. As you can see, 200 empty array, all fine. We have nothing in our database. We wouldn't see anything. But if we have a post here, let's just create Nick's first post and we just hit execute you see that a post was created with this ID. Let's copy that. And let's see our database now. What do we have here? If I run this again, sure enough, we have a post created in our database. I haven't, we didn't write a single line of SQL, it just works, and that's amazing. Let's try to get this document, so, sorry, this object. Again, we can read it. Let's try to update it. So, next, first, edited post so if I execute that my post is now edited I can say it again let's select that as you can see it's updated and last but not least let's delete it so 
So 204 deleted if I run it again. In this case, I'm getting a 500 error. So the migration from the service to um, the, yeah. And that's because I didn't add a null check here. This could actually return null. So in my case, I should do if post equals null return uh, false, that nothing was actually deleted. So if I run this again, that's on me, by the way. I think I, I removed the previous code accidentally. So if I do that again, yeah, 404, I get nothing back. That's all I want to show you for today. Leave a like if you like this video and subscribe for more content like this. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.